Would it be better if Beethoven's music was still under copyright or owned by Germany and only playable by Germans in the country? So this is a, a mix of a, of a few thoughts that I've had about different topics. I think this will go into my what is art. I started a series some time back about what is art. And my whole question was, what is art? You know, going with like, oh, the question of life, what is art? What comma is art? I think just asking that question in general is something that is artistic and I think is unique to the human condition, at least from what we know. I don't know if you could say, like, let's say there's a borer bird or something like that that makes these little displays and these little, uh, I, f I forget what it's called, the actual name, but it makes these little hovels, these little huts, and it decorates it with different things and then it attracts the females. I I think when, when you see those kind of displays with other animals, <laughs> there's something I saw with penguins. I, I had a separate video talking about our penguins, birds, and I guess they actually are birds. It's talking about how do you define birds. When you think of a bird, you don't think of flying. You think of the air. You think of wings. But what, does the penguin fly? No. Does it have wings? Yes, the flippers actually are wings. Does it have feathers? Uh, technically, kind of, sort of, it does. But – so those kind of things, what is a bird? There are many things in life we ask, what is this? And we kind of get to an understanding like, oh, that is that, and that is this because of this and this and that. So now when it comes to art, what is art? When it comes to that, when it comes to this question, what is the actual art itself? Who owns the art? How is it created? Where does the ownership go? And then it's, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a longer thought that I've had where I think of Team Human, where I just consider ourselves to be some of the things we create are just in humanity. And I just got this question out because it's it's something that is under, underlying uh, many things that I'm trying to do with my life and I've been thinking about my life and how to go forward if I'm creating art, if I'm creating a studio, if I'm trying to communicate some of these things out there. How is How do you work with it in the certain concepts that we have as a civilization, as a human species, as as people, as, as, as social beings. So I'm just going to read you some of the things that some people wrote when I posted this. And there's a reading that somebody posted this article I'm going to get into, and you'll see that it is related, has something to do with intellectual property and ownership of these things. With this one, one of the background thoughts that I will expand on probably in a separate video was thinking about how currently there are certain countries who are saying countries in the past came and took certain artifacts from their countries and now needs to go back to those countries. Or in a more theoretical sense, you'll hear people say black culture, black arts are the ones that are stolen the most in the United States of America. But then how do you define those black culture and black arts? Like are, if they're using a guitar, the guitar wasn't invented by a black man. So is that something that is white culture? Who owns the actual things that are actually created? Something like Beethoven, specifically with Beethoven's music. And um, most of the classical music, and when you think of classical music, there's a lot of music that was made, but there's only a few composers and a few works of those composers that comprises pretty much all you think of when you think of classical music. Even though that kind of orchestral music, which is what classical music mostly is, is orchestral music, and that field has continued. Even though when you think of classical, you think of that. For me, some of my favorite ones, the contemporary ones, are through role-playing games, so a lot of Square Enix role-playing games, the Japanese role-playing games, like Nobuo Uematsu, there's, um, who else is on there? Takahito Iguchi was somebody who did some more like jazz electronic type of stuff in the Final Fantasy X2. Then there's Yasunori Mitsuda, who has done the Chrono Chrono series, like Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross, which is to me amazing stuff. And with that one, it's it's tying in the more way with those games, you actually go in and you play the characters. And I think with that interactive art with the music and the visuals and the reading and the sound, I think that's that's a more full encompassing kind of experience. And with things like classical music. Oh, oh yeah, there's also things in like the film, the Hans Zimmers and those kind of people. And recently, uh, en Ennio Morricone just died and he had some great music with his spaghetti westerns and I still listen to some of his songs and still brings back those memories of watching the westerns with my dad when I was like, oh, <laughs> we little kid. So there's, there's kind of things that kind of tie in with that. And with Beethoven's music, it was actually, 
it lapsed before there was this kind of modern day environment where we have copyrights for all kinds of things. And it was in just the general, you can just go on YouTube. I can actually just play actual music in my videos. I could have Ode to Joy in every single one of my videos and even actually make money off of them without somebody coming in and putting like some kind of strike on it and saying, oh, this is by, this, this, this company owns it. You can't actually use this music without it. So how does it come? Where is the ownership of these things? Because some of these things, are actually things that were created long before the country that is saying this country needs to bring this thing back to us. Like the country that is living in that place, let's just speak about Egypt in particular. There's certain things Egypt is saying. Other countries have taken these things from Egypt that need to come back to Egypt. And I'll expand on this in a separate video, but those things were created by people in that general location that did not call that place Egypt. That that civilization, those people themselves are dead, of course, but that civilization itself did not just transition into modern-day Egypt. Modern-day Egypt is a different civilization that moved in after that. It's different peoples. So technically, what is the claim? That was definitely before copyright law. That was definitely before those things. So how do they still claim to have ownership over that thing? Now, with Beethoven's music, it is it has lapsed into what they call the public domain. Because it's certain here that the copyright duration for of composed music is the same for books, paintings, and other literally literary or artistic works. The author's lifetime plus 70 years. Therefore, the musical compositions of old masters like Beethoven, who lived from 1770 to 1827, or Mozart, who lived from 1756 to 1791, are all in the public domain, and you can use them, you can freely use them. Now, I get there is something in here for, oh, they're saying if you actually put in the time to create that, you're given this buffer to actually financially benefit from it or control its use. So there is something in there. But imagine if they could just still do that. They could be like, no, we're just calling this back. If Egypt can do it for, its, for, for certain things, certain artifacts, why can't Beethoven's family do this? Why can't Germany claim that ownership? Because we still hold Germany, Germans, or other peoples like that responsible for negative things their ancestors did. So why can't they also take ownership of the actual physical creations that their ancestors, relative ancestors and peoples in groups did? Okay, so that's just some of where I'm trying to get at with this. Let me get into the actual reading of, of what people wrote here and see this. So the first person wrote, like, it's a rough one. I suppose if Germany are both willing to steward uh, the music of Bach, then Greece should have been hosting the Olympics every day for the last four years. And my answer was like, yeah, where does ownership of art come in? What's the difference between arts and crafts? If a craftsman makes something practical, why does the cultural, why does that have cultural ownership, um, but something like a song uh, or should not? That's, that's what I was talking about here in specific. Let's say there was something that was made by people who lived in Egypt back in the days of the pharaohs, and it was an obelisk or something, and then the, col the colonialists or whatever, even if the Romans who came in at that time, when they conquered Egypt, they decided to take some of those things and move them back. This was the Roman Empire. It was part of the Roman Empire. It's like, let's say in the United States of America finds something in where it's Texas right now, and then they move it to Washington, D.C., and then Texas somehow later on down the line gets, it in gets its independence and leaves the United States of America. Should Texas say, like, oh, now you have to bring that back? It's like, no, that thing was moved when it was still the United States of America. So that thing, those, some of those things were moved from Egypt when Egypt was a colony or was a uh, was or pro protectorate or was part of the Roman Empire. It was not under the current government that is there now. So how do they have claimed to bring those things back? That's just my question to that. The person answered, okay, so I really don't know. I was recently told by a friend not to wear cornrows. I don't know how she thinks that little French braids on a white, on a white head demeans her as a POC, as a person of color. I don't care. If a POC wants to listen to Bach, I don't feel less of a person for it. I don't think I can answer your question because I believe culture should be respected. Aspects of culture, things like tacos, kimonos, rap, opera, etc., should be open source and allowed to deepen one's own sense of self. And my response to that was like, why are they even called French braids? And this is the thing, like some of these cornrows, like why is it, is, was that something that was, did the French invent this? Like, I don't understand why it was called that. And the person answered, that is a good question, considering that it's a term from my childhood that, and never was uh, induced uh, the curiosity until now. I have to say yet again, I don't know. You just keep throwing stumpers tonight. 
Okay, so that's somebody, I have, have some good conversations back and forth with them. Okay, so the next person said, owned by his ancestors. Then I said, okay, descendants or ancestors? And if I marry into the family, do I own part of it? What if I then get a divorce? If divorce ends it, but I had kids with a descendant, then do my kids' genetic percent give them a stake? What if the kid was adopted, but the Beethoven descendant died? So, and the person corrected that said, yeah, direct descendants, no one else. So yeah, that, that's, then that's why I was asking like descendants or ancestors, he clarified that. And I said, if you marry into, if it's a direct descendant, so this is somebody that can track direct lineage from that, and I marry into that person, legally, don't, don't we normally share certain things in that sense? Where if they own it, then you're saying, I'm not a direct descendant because I've married into the family. But then with the legal systems that exist now, there normally is some kind of a joint ownership of certain things. Now, that's also depending on the marriage contract that you actually get into. So if you're saying it's just with the genetic aspect of it. So even if somebody was adopted out of the family and they can actually find they have some genetic actual <laughs> relation to Beethoven, they can still claim some ownership even if they don't know about it. So would, my, would the kid that I had with that person even if we have a divorce, have ownership, even though they share genes that are a certain percentage or less, where do you go to the point where you're like, okay, finally you're out of the actual lineage of Beethoven's genes that you no longer actually own that anymore? So my response to them when they cleared out the direct descendants and no one else, I said, okay, so how do you define that? Accepting that he did not contractually will this. How many people removed changes it? And how does this only work for positive things? This is a sort of original sin, white guilt type of thing. If your descendants own a painting you created, why aren't they responsible for a crime you committed? And now this is where I think the thing comes with the whole Egypt thing. Some of the claim is that this were things that were taken away from us in a negative way and you're not allowed to profit from the crime of your ancestors. Now this is something I agree. If there is, let's say, a house somewhere and my father somehow stole that house from somebody and I and then in, I inherit that house from him, I don't know this is it was a stolen house, and then the person whose house was stolen comes eventually comes back and shows a deed that they have ownership of that house. I don't think I should be thrown in jail for actually having li be living in that house. But if that person is still alive, I don't think I should actually keep that house because I inherited it in a legal manner without actually violating any certain crimes in that place because it was not my father's to own to begin with. So there is that question in there. So that's the kind of thing I understand. But then I'm with passing it on. I don't think that person's great great grandson should be able to just come in eventually like years down the line and say okay you stole this from my father way back and then now we're taking it back after you've developed all these other things on that land my ancestors my descendants at that time so that's that's the kind of thing that i'm wondering with that how far does this go how long does this go and this goes back to the whole thing why is he focusing on only the positive things why isn't also the negative things? When you, this is part of why they're talking about the things like reparations. They're saying, oh, the whites did this, Americans did this, so we need reparations to the blacks to give them back for these kind of things. But how far back does that go? Do you have to go and get the reparations from the African slave traders that initially caught those tribes people and sold them on the western, the west coast of Africa on the Atlantic slave trade. But then now you find out that, oh, some of those people might have been in some back and forth battles between each other, stealing land, stealing property, stealing things back and forth. And then you might actually be able to tally and see that before that, that battle that ended up capturing these people for years, for decades, for centuries before that, this tribe that eventually was defeated and sold off had actually been subjugating that other tribe and enslaving them in a different way. And so it, you could actually almost argue that they actually deserve to pay more back. So some of these things, just it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, so the next response here. He said, it's hard to even imagine a time when you wanted music performed, you needed to get a whole bunch of musicians together. Want to hear that symphony? Copyright or no? You need to get an entire orchestra first. And this is part of the amazing thing. I, I think from what I know of, of history, we live in the best time ever. People are like, oh, 2020, like, it's not going to end. It's all. I'm like, no, you don't understand history. This is amazing. The fact that we're hearing all this information might make it seem a lot worse than it actually is. When we actually look back, I think 20 years from now, 100 years from now, we're like, okay, people are freaking out. People, think about the stocking of toilet paper. Remember what happened to that? Think about how many different hysterias have happened in 2020 and what the effect of those things has been. How many of the actual fears have actually come due or how many things have just been 
kind of just swept under the carpet or just dumped into the memory hole where we just don't even like realize that people were freaking out about that thing anymore and it was found to not be a thing. Just in 2020, and we still got a, we still got what, a quarter? No, we still almost got, yeah, we got a, a third to go, a third more of this year to go. A lot more in, inane things are going to happen before this year is over. But despite that, we just have all this amazing information and access to just the human experience. And I want to take part in it. I want to create some more things and put some more things out there and give back for all the things that I've gained from actually getting access to these things. We're seeing with the entertainment industry, I think that is one thing that's going to have a massive change post-pandemic to see these different ways that people are going to be getting communication and information out. And we've seen just the amazing limitations even with the pandemic itself, in the messaging that's been going on. Just as I'm reading this, I just saw that today and yet another person has come from somewhere that's more on the left politically on MSNBC. She was a producer and she left and said, yeah, these people just they admit that they're some sort of cancer. It was some paraphrasing. Someone was like, we're a cancer and there's no cure. And if you find a cure, you can change the world. And it's the thing, it's communicating the information. The just the number of human inter intelligence vectors that we have now, the, the ability to have those acquired in ignorance destruction systems, that is world changing. That is going to save the world, that will make it a better place. And part of that is the spreading and sharing of information and experience. And that's why I'm trying to ask and see what is art? Because I think with art, that question, what is the thing that makes humans humans? And we ask it in art, in a, in a certain way. Language itself is art. Even just formulating the idea, what? is art. Just asking that question, is some sort of art, like what is this besides just what it is, instead of just reacting to what it is? And I think we need to, to find better ways to understand some of these things. Okay, so now we're going to get into the one where it's close to the place where I'm going to actually read the article. So somebody wrote this. So Stephen Kinsella is, is, is correct, and this is the article I'm going to read. All of IP, intellectual property, is a spurious concept. It bears no real relationship to actual property, which is naturally exclusive. Even intangible, such as public stock ownership, is merely a representation of a share of physical profits to be paid to the owner. Now, this goes into like a very technical dive of it. It's in the, in the econ sense, when people normally think of economy, they think of the financial sense, the monies and things like this and goods. But I think everything is economy. Econ is everywhere. The Thomas Sowell three are some of the three questions that are based. He normally says this is what you ask people on the political left to kind of ferret out what they're kind of thinking about. If they, can, they can't normally answer two out of three of those questions. Questions, and it's normally compared to what, what solid proof do you have, and at what cost. And I ask those, look, you can ask those in other parts of life, and you like actually find answers to that. Like this one, Beethoven writes the music, he creates it, he puts it out there. Once it's out there, how does he maintain ownership over that? Or how does somebody else claim ownership over that? How their claim is compared to what? Your claim of ownership of it compared to whose other claim? At what cost do you actually have? And the cost I think would be like, okay, what was the cost of you actually creating that? What is the thing? What is the cost of one person owning it versus it being in the public domain? I kind of think of that maybe in that kind of sense. What would the cost be of actually enforcing that supposed ownership? How would you be able to actually stop other people from listening to it or performing it or things like that. As a person mentioned in that previous one, there was a time when to actually play the music, you didn't just have, you just have, be able to just download it or just go online and listen to it on your phone and just have some kind of audio version of it. You actually had to have an orchestra. So you actually had to have the amount of time to actually hire enough people in that kind of sex. And so it was already limited in that kind of thing. And then there was a time when you could say, okay, what solid proof do you have to actually have the ownership if you had the direct descendants thing? And now maybe there's better proof to actually find it. We can say like, okay, the actual genes of the people, and you can say, okay, we get to a certain percentage of the actual genes and you actually have some ownership over it if you want to say it is somehow tied to somebody's genetics. But then like the, do the people before, because it might be somebody who has some of Beethoven's genetics, but not descended from it because it's like somebody like his cousin or his sister or something had a kid. And then they happen to stay closer to the actual genetics of the family. And they sign to have more similar. So they, they, they kind of all these things. And now if you reclone a Beethoven in the distant future, would he all of a sudden retake ownership over what the original Beethoven did? There are some different sci-fi type of things that are in there. So my response before I actually read the, read the article, it's Against Intellectual Prof Property by Steve, Stefan, I think it's Stefan Kinsella. It could be Stephen, right? It's S-T-E-P-H-A-N. So I think it's Stefan Kinsella. Uh, my response to the person posting this was, it is very complicated. I shall read to see what his take on it is. But I think of my art, and once it's out of my mind, it isn't really mine anymore. Someone can commission me to realize some idea we have, and I can use my body and abilities to do it, to create it. But once it's out there, once it's 
outside of me? How do I maintain any realistic ownership of it? If it's an audiobook, then why is it less real than writing it directly on paper? Due to the physical medium? Anyway, thanks for the link. And I'm going to read that link. And then somebody answered there. It was like, yeah, trying to own abstractions always means violating someone's, someone's physical property. And this is the thing. Like, if I actually had my entire channel was on a book, then I said, okay, now would that change it if you have to physically buy the book in order to get it versus just listening to what I'm saying? Let's say you did actually own the things that this is being played on. Somebody else was playing this for you. Could I hold you somehow accountable and say, oh, you have violated my ownership of my the thing that I produced, my voice. Now, if I'm just walking in the street and talking and talking out loud and I don't think anybody else is there, but then you can hear me and then you hear something I say, then can you say like, okay, now, now that's part of your ideas in your mind, then you go out and you do something with it. I'm, let's say I'm just discussing some plan to create some new kind of invention, and I never actually create it, but you hear it. Why should you have to some, somehow come back to me? And let's say I had no intention of creating it, but you actually end up actually creating it or finishing it apart to something that you had in mind, and you actually create that. Why should I say that me just going out and talking in the street into the nothingness that happened to be heard by somebody who had the other parts to create that thing, somehow I have a claim on some of the thing that that person made? There's, there's a lot of things in here that are rather complicated. So let's go and see what Stefan Kinsella said here. Let me click that link. Uh, it's, a, it's at the Mises Institute. Okay, so it turns out, oh, there's actually already an audiobook. So I shall leave a link to the audiobook, and let me just read the excerpt that's written here. It says, um, would a libertarian society recognize patents as legitimate? What about copyright? In Against Intellectual Property, Stefan Kinsella, a patent attorney for many years, um, of many years' as experience, offers his, his response to these questions. Kinsella is altogether opposed to intellectual property, and he explains his position in this brief but wide-ranging book. So there's, there's a link here. There's the PDFs uh, against intellectual property. You can get the PDF here. You can get an EPUB, which is an uh, electronic uh, book. And this was saying there's so many four ways you can actually get this actual information. Contra la propriedad intellectual. I think that could be in I, – I think that is uh, Portuguese and – this is, interestingly enough, a rather large, uh, lib for, for libertarians, for the size of libertarian communities, there's a rather large one in, uh, in Brazil. So I think this has been translated into Brazilian. And you can listen to audiobook here. You can buy it from the Mises store. Uh, you can get the audiobook. Yeah, the audiobook is there for free. I'm going to download the audiobook and I'm going to listen to this. It's a 73-page PDF. So if you prefer reading it, you can get that. And this is just what I'm talking about. This person has put the information out there. He's also put the ability to purchase it. You can find Stefan Kinsella and you can probably donate to him. And that is what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm looking at more of a, of a thing where I love to create art as much as you can love something that can't love you back. That's not necessarily virtuous. It's something that I am passionate about in that sense. <laughs> Some of the words I even like, I don't know he's passionate. You're talking about like sexual stuff. But it's something that is, that is really meaningful to me where I am rather selective about what I create. There's certain things like if a church came to me, the Vatican was like, oh, we need you to create like uh, something for like Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve Mass. I'd be like, no, because I don't really agree with the message that's being sent. I don't believe in those things. If a government is like, oh, we want to do some political posters, I'm like, eh, not quite sure because I don't really want to be paid through the taxation and things like this. I don't really agree with those things. So I've, I've gotten into some situation where it's not necessarily starving artists, but it's as limited some of the things that I actually create. I want to message better with the abilities that I have because I'm like, okay, I'm putting in some experience and some thoughts and some unique creation process into these things and there's certain things I want to message and I'm not looking to just get in a situation where I'm just filthy rich like flying all over the world but there's, there's certain things I want to do with my life and be able to do the things that I enjoy doing because I think I'm capable of doing that I like that value for value type of process even with the site Patreon which is going through some issues right now might not be there anymore due to the terms and conditions that the site had and then people are going to kind of just file suit against them and then they have to actually cover the actual uh, costs. It's like $10,000 per person or something that could actually flatten the company. But then there's other sources like Subscribe, subscribe Star. There's other, there's other ways of doing it. That whole crowdfunding thing is a positive thing. That whole idea of getting patronage from somebody, somebody saying, we value what you can do. We're either just going to 
pay you out of appreciation. There's a value for value system that's actually done by this is podcast, greatest podcast in the world, the No Agenda Show. They do this value for value system that I think other people have done also, um, where they actually just create content and then they have producers and they have people who say, we value your content and we've gotten this appreciation, this monetary amount, and we're giving you this amounts of money to it to keep making this content. Some of the people have systems where they say, okay, if you give me this much, I can you can actually request certain things from me. But some of them are just like, if you enjoy me creating the things that I like to create, the content I like to create, and you feel that's valuable, you feel you get some worth out of it, you actually find some people who are just supporting that. And it doesn't even take that many people. You could have things where in most of these value for value systems, you have a thing where it's like 95% plus over that of the people who actually enjoy the content don't actually pay for the content, but they still gain some value. They might share it. They might spread it out to the people, to that smaller percentage of people that will actually say we're getting enough out of it to pay directly. And I think as the world changes, not even changes, might actually be going back to the days where in the past, you had artists who had that patronage, who were working for the Vatican, who were working for these wealthier people and things like that, who would commission certain art pieces, and that's how those artists would actually make a living. And and I, 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 I'm not necessarily against that. And I think with the increased access to information and people and technology and and ideas, it's going to it's going to increase this. And I think putting these ideas out, where I can be like, okay, I'm putting this stuff out. I, I have this cloud storytelling idea that I want to be very interactive. I've seen other people do similar things. I've been in talks with a few people that are in that similar field. And hopefully, hopefully something can come out of that soon. I can I can talk to you more about that. If you have been following this channel over the last three years, thank you very much. And you've heard me mention this before. There is a video particularly where I was talking about some dream that I had. And it's, it's a rambling video, but it's still that general idea. And I'm at the cusp of actually finally launching it. There's been some breaks in this pandemic, some things coming and rethinking some things and scheduling some things around and whatnot. But something's coming. Something will be done where I'll, I'll figure out some kind of system. But this, this whole thing of ownership, I want to create part and return just part of this human story. This We can all own these things. Because these things I'm creating are not just out of my mind. There are certain concepts and things that are common sense or just in the human knowledge sphere that a few people created and came up with. Like a simple thing, I was, I was talking with someone, someone was, it was a separate video I just posted about you know, Carl Sagan's uh, nine ways to avoid, it was allegedly Carl Sagan's nine ways to avoid uh, fake news. And someone is like, okay, you can't really learn some of these things. But then I, I use the analogy of art where I said, okay, think about something like perspective. Like I probably couldn't teach you if you're just a random person and you've never drawn something in your life really since you were a kid and I taught you for two, three years, you probably couldn't draw as well as I can. You might be able to draw other things rather competently, but it wouldn't be exactly like I can draw. But I could teach you the concept of perspective when it comes to art in a few hours, if, if not shorter than that. I could teach you those things because... Somebody came up with it. Let me actually check. It says here from the Oklahoma Academic Ac Academy of Classical Art that the Greeks and Romans understood perspective, but over time their knowledge is lost. Plato wrote, Thus, through perspective, every sort of confusion is revealed within us. And this is that weakness of the human mind on which the art of conjuring and deceiving and of deceiving by light and shadow and other ingenious devices imposes, having an effect upon us like magic. And the arts of measuring and numbering and weighing come to the rescue of human understanding. There is beauty in them. There is the beauty in them. And the apparent greater or less or more or heavier no longer have mastery over us, but give way before calculation and measure of weight. Okay, so with that, and then it said it was 15th century Italian architect and engineer Filippo Brunelleschi who rediscovered the laws of perspective. He demonstrated a mathematical approach that proved how forms and space shrink in size according to their location and distance from the eye. In, 19, in 1435, Leon Battista Alberti discovered the first theory of linear perspective and published his treatise uh, Della Pictura on painting in which he too relied on mathematics as the common ground of art and science. Alberti's discovery has, an, has 
had an enormous impact on European artists and is still used by artists and designers and architects today. So it's something like this. Do they own that? Do the Greeks and Romans somehow own that content? If an Egyptian is actually creating art right now using perspective, can the Greeks and Romans say, oh, you took that from our ancestors. You're not allowed to use perspective. That is ours. Do I owe that to them? Or am I just participating in this thing where that is a general concept? You look around. Perspective exists. You put your hand out Hold your hand out, look at your actual palm in front of your face, full length, and then bring it closer to your face. It's the same size hand, but the, the size of it is going to change. That is something that is something we experience. If you can see, that is something you just experience regularly. But it said it was lost. When you actually quantify it, when you actually put that idea down in some kind of way, in some formula that you can actually impart that knowledge to somebody else, that is something different than it actually just being something you experience. Because the truth is the truth. It's just out there. It's just what you see. It's what you experience. So why is it that we live in a time where there are so many things, there's so many things that were created by people so many ideas that people have put out there and have shared with us and decided not to just keep it to themselves that they've put out there that I have benefited from. I'm not drawing these things, coming up with these things on my own. I might be arranging them in specific ways that maybe only I can do it. Maybe if you got a billion other people, you would find somebody else who could somehow do it in the same way. But I just feel like I can't just own that by myself. It would be a disservice to just myself and just my general feeling. If I could just find a way to just do it where it's, it's just... It's, it's our art. It's part of the human story. It's part of just the human experience. I, I, I don't necessarily know how to explain it, but um, that's, that's just what I'm, what I'm trying to say. If you believe there actually are some kind of ownerships of things, how far does ownership go? Specifically, when you're talking about arts, what's the difference with arts and crafts? Why is it something where if it's digital art or it's something like it's just actually on a computer and things like that, why would that be any different from an actual physical painting? And let's say somebody was creating something that was more practical and then somebody else comes in and says, okay, no, that's actually artistic and I don't want to actually use it for the practical sense. Does that change it into something that is artistic? What if you have a situation where you have a certain civilization and location or people that created something and had some value in something and then the people that come in after that or it gets lost like this, where the people no longer value it anymore but somebody from outside comes in and sees the value in that thing and takes that thing and stores it and keeps it safe and nurtures that thing and then they take it back somewhere else should they have the ownership of that thing now that since the people who had possession of it at least physical possession of that thing had actually lost the value or not using it in a certain way because i actually have seen situations where there are some old african artifacts things like the wooden masks and things like that when the religions were actually left behind or those traditions were left behind those things were just chopped up and used as firewood yet you have certain cultures where that would be considered an artifact and kept and stored for his historical and significance and things like that. So there's so many things that change with this. It's it's a complicated thing. I'm, I'm going to probably just try to go away from more of the politics things. But as mentioned here, I do think art is the language of life. I think it's it's involved in many things and it's things that I am familiar with. So I'll try to get more of my channel. I think more of the content I'm going to go forward with is going to be more just conversational things and focusing more on arts and creation and creativity as I also create and get more of my creativity out there in that sense. So yeah, just thank you for listening. Like, share, subscribe. Till next time, there's links to a merchandise store where I put some of the arts and things that I do on merchandise. It's a red bubble store. There's shirts, there's coasters. I really like the coasters. There's, there's masks for the, as the pandemic is going on. Even after the pandemic, I'm still going to be wearing masks because there's kind of some cool kind of masks you can actually put and things like that. So anyway, that's it for now. Till next time, goodbye.